10th chapter, if you would. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And let's all stand as we honor God's word by standing. And I'm going to begin reading to you in verse 19. And I'm going to read through verse 25. Once you listen to these words as we, as we read them to you, the title of the message is going to be provoke, Provoking to Love and Good Works. And that's something that's important. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Provoking to love and good works. He says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. We just sang the song about it. By the new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. And, to, and this is to say his flesh. And having, in other words, he gave himself there for us. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And now, here's a key verse right here for the title, for the title of my message today, verse 24. He says, he says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not not to provoke other ways, not to not to lead people other ways, but lead them lead them to God to provoke to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some are or is, but exhorting one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you for the blessings of it, Lord. We thank you for the time we have here together. Lord, I just pray that you'll give me the unction I need today, give me the sight I need, uh, give me whatever I need today, Lord, to preach this message that you've given me today, Lord. You know what I need, and you know you know how I, I, I trust you every day, Lord, and, and I, I know that I haven't been the best of servants, but, but Lord, you know I trust you every day. I trust you every Lord's Day to go with me, and every Wednesday night, and, and every time we meet, Lord, I trust you to go with me and, and give me what I need to say and let, and, and let me understand uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm reading and, and be able to see what I'm reading. Thank you, Lord, for everything. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Provoking to love and good works, not enabling. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that with, uh, with all assurance. Not in enabling. We don't enable one another. We don't enable our children, which is sometimes done. We don't enable our children. We don't, uh, uh, we, we, uh, Provoke our children to good works. And I was looking at uh, those li little lights as they were up there, you know. We, we, got a, we got a little set of lights coming up. And uh, I was wondering how their lights were shining so greatly. Well, we got some of the older lights. I wonder if their lights are shining today too. You know, that's, uh, that's what you wonder. You know, what a, what, a great, what a great opportunity we have as God's children to not only to provoke one another to love and to good works, but also to, to provoke even our children to love and good works. You know, we don't do things that drive them away or draw them away. We do things that bring them back close to the Lord. You know, the average Christian would rather not work for the Lord after they are saved. That's the average Christian. The average Christian wants to walk, walk a church aisle, take the preacher by the hand, go into the baptismal waters, and then figure they have nothing else to do but just sit. Sometimes they listen, and if I was to uh, show of hands today, how many of you read the, the, the words of wisdom in the, in the uh, don't, I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many uh, read the words of wisdom in the bulletin? You know, this is, uh, if, for those of you who didn't read it, you need to read it because of the fact is that what we say there, what we say there is that uh, we need to put legs on our prayers. 
You know, it's a wonderful thing to pray, but if you just get up and pray and think that that's all that's necessary in praying, you know, you, you, you know you, you'd pray and then you'd act out your prayers. Whatever it is you prayed, you'd act them out. Why, why, why does it do any good to pray for the lost if you don't, if you don't uh, go to the lost and you don't talk to the lost about, about the Lord? So that's the average Christian does not want to uh, work for the Lord. Why, why is this so? Well, a um, lot of it. A lot of reasons why. A lot of reasons out there why the average Christian does not work. It's because he, the person may be sitting beside him don't, doesn't work. The person that may be the closest to him or her doesn't work. Or the, and and rather, than, rather than work, the person close to them may be the enabler. And so certainly this is something that we need, we need to realize. The average Christian has a difficult time separating the work of God, the work, I'm sorry, the work God does and, and, and his or her life from the work that God expects the child of God expects them to do. So, you know, uh, you know, we know what God's done for us. I hear it all the time. I hear it every day. I, every Sunday, every Wednesday night, I hear how much God, I read it on Facebook, how much God has done for us. But how much have we done for others? How much have we gone out and helped others? That's the key to this message this morning. Is how, how much have we done to, for others? How, how many people did you actually sit down and talk to this week and tell them about Jesus? You know, uh, I heard that, uh, I, I heard through some of the little children from down there at, um, uh, at um, Tombs, County, uh, Tombs Central School that our little girls are talking to others. I heard that. I heard that out of one of the one of the little girls that uh, that comes to church here. Talk about I was talking to my friends, and and you know, you know. Let's listen to this. I know some some people may think about we're going to baptize uh, 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 Aniston uh, next Sunday morning, Lord willing, everything goes as as we think it's going to, but. Uh, how, how, many, uh, how many people sometimes have doubt in what a child knows and what a child is doing? I know they do. I've already heard it. I've already heard it. I've, I, I haven't heard the very words, but I've heard it through the grapevine, you know. Uh, they're, they're awfully young. Well, let me tell you, folks, these children know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. One, one, of the, one of the most wonderful Christian women that I've, I've known in my life that uh, was, was actually saved when she was five years old. She was a great witness for the Lord. Great witness for the Lord. Brother Jim Jeffries' wife, Brother Robbie Jeffries' mother, uh, uh, she, she, was a, she was a great worker for the Lord. She, but she was saved when she was five years old. And, and she, she's a great worker for the Lord. She was a great witness. She was a great witness. And, and so that's a, that goes to show you right there that you, they're not too young. They're not too young. I'm looking forward to baptizing Aniston next Sunday, and I'm looking forward to her to be a great witness for the Lord. And, and, I, and I pray that I, I think that's going to happen. I really do. I really believe that's going to happen. She's going to be a great witness uh, uh, for the Lord, and so that's what that's that's a, that's an important thing. Now, in other words, they have um, they have a a hard time separating the flesh from the Spirit of God, separating what the flesh wants to do and what the Spirit of God wants them to do. You know, if we follow after the flesh, we're going to live a fleshly life. If we follow after the Spirit, we're going to live a spiritual life. And the problem we have today is. People are living out their desires and what they want to do. I mean, we got it right now, what they want to do. They, uh, we got some of our young people. They want to be where the crowd is. They want to be where the other young people are. They want to be where the partying is and all, all those things. But that's not, that's not the way it should be. Not the way it should be. It should be, 
It should be the fact that, that we want to stay away from those things. We want to be away from those things. You know, there's nothing wrong in, in doing that. You know, uh, uh, I, I know that my girls, when they would come in and they want to go to some party or something, I'd say, you can't go. Well, they'll say, well, brother so-and-so's daughter's going. That don't make any difference. I would tell them that don't make any difference. If brother so-and-so, if ever brother so-and-so's daughter's going, it's not a place to be. It's not a place that you should be. And certainly we, we've got to provoke our kids to good works. We've got to provoke our brothers and sisters to good works. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't just sit by and let them go to waste. We don't just sit by and let them fall completely down to where they're so backslidden they don't know if they'll ever get back or not. And, and, and I, I'm afraid. I, 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 do believe, I do believe there's a hump there that once you get over that hump, you've gone too far. I really believe that. And I'm not saying that you lose your salvation, but what I'm saying is you're, you come to the point to where you, you are showing to people that you're not even saved. You don't want to see nobody get over that hump and to where they get in that position, to where they don't even know whether they're saved or not. And certainly that's what they're doing, but we're to provoke them to, to, to love and to good works. As the Bible says, uh, the body we carry with us has so much sin attached to it that God chose to purify it through, through the grave. And in the case of uh, if the Lord comes back before we die, then he's going to purify it immediately. He's going, he's going to purify this body, but God's going to purify this body, and he chooses to do it through the grave. And, and certainly that's something that's going to happen. God does not save the body. He did, not, he, did, he did not save the body. God does not save the body. He does not uh, uh, choose to work. God does not choose to work with these bodies. He works with our souls. He works with the spirit that is in us and through us. He works, he works with that. He doesn't work with our bodies. God, God doesn't work with our bodies. He doesn't. But, but the spirit of God is what controls our bodies and our steps and where we go and what we do. The Spirit of God is what controls that. And what I'm seeing today, the Spirit of God is making a mockery of a lot of people, if that's the case, because they're not doing the things that, that they should be doing. I see that every day. Uh, God could, could have done this. To, God, God could have saved a body, but he didn't do it. He chose to, to leave it the way it was, and give us the power to overcome it by uh, ordaining good works. He, 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 we, he, he, he gives us the power to overcome this flesh. Where, where are the good works? Where the good works is, as he says there in, in the 25th ver, or the 24th verse, let us consider one another, let us consider one another, right here, let us consider one another, let us consider one another, those that's not here today, let us consider one another and, and to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, how much do you love the Lord? How much do you love being in the God's house? How much do you love being here today? Well, there's some don't love being in the church. I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where some of these areas are that I see on Facebook. You know, where, where, where are some of these areas? You know, people are so happy to be there, so happy to be there. I, I don't know of any other place I'd be happy to be than in the Lord's house on the Lord's day and on Wednesday nights. I look forward to it. You know, I'm, I'm up here today preaching to you just partially blind, just to tell you the truth. But let me tell you, folks, it's something that, uh, uh, that God provokes us God, the Spirit, provokes us to love good works. We're to provoke one another to love and the good works. We're to pass that along. Uh, there are whole denominations that are formed because of works. There are those who have taken God's use of, of works uh, after the, for, for, for salvation and such in that. Then there are those on the other end of the spectrum who believe they need to do nothing because it is, it is God who is leading them to do nothing. God doesn't lead us to do nothing. 
And I heard that. I heard that one time. Well, well, you know, if God, if God, uh, uh, if God predestinated me to do this, then then evidently it must be okay, or God wouldn't predestinate me to do it. Let me tell you, folks. Let's don't forget that God, God also has a God also has a wheel in which He will sometimes let you have the rope, and He'll sometimes let you go out and hang yourself. Sure is. It's called God's permissive will. God permits us to do things, and we get ourselves in trouble, and then He chastises us. He's already preordained and predestinated that he's going to chastise us. When is your chastising coming? When is it coming? When right down here in the 25th verse, he says, forsaking not to assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the, the day approaching. Where, where is that exhorting of one another? You know, we just, we just accept the fact that uh, we don't need to say anything to anybody about not coming to church. And, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of it as you are. I'm just as guilty of it as you are because let me tell you, folks, there are some people don't come to church enough to keep their name on the roll. I'm serious about that. And, and certainly that's something that, that, that we need to consider. You know, we need to consider that, you know, and, and consider to provoke to love and good works. Then there are those on the... Oh, well, we haven't said that. Uh, then, um, let's go on down here. They, they are in danger of damnation. They have blasphemed the very Holy Spirit who is supposed to be leading them by accusing him of leading them to do nothing. It is sin not to work for the Lord after one is saved and taught. Once you're taught, it's a sin not to work for the Lord not to do for the Lord. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't let your children control you. You control your children. Just like God, God doesn't let us control him. He controls us. That's the same way with you and your children. Your children don't control you. You control them. You tell them what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. You got some that's not in church today as it should be. I, I like Michael back there sitting back on the back row. He told us other Wednesday night, he said, I'm so glad I get to come to church on Sundays. And that's not too many young people say stuff like that. He said, I'm so glad that I've got a job closer to home here now to where, to where I can come to church on Sundays and Wednesday nights. And, and that, that blessed my heart when I hear things like that. Blesses my heart. You know, we, we think things like that never come out of our children's mouths. But it came out of his. You know, he, he's grateful to be to we be in church. And, and I'm thankful that Michael can be in church. <clears throat> I'm thankful he can be here. Because all of them know that I've preached to them on Wednesday nights at the table in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Rio, the Mexican restaurant. You know, I tell them, I tell them what they should be doing and such. So, you know, let me tell you, folks, this is something that this is a lifelong 24-hour-a-day job that we have as God's children, and that is to provoke to love and the good works. We're to do that. We're to do that. We see somebody slipping. David, David said in one of the Psalms, he said, I found myself slipping. But he said, God got a hold of me, and he, got, he straightened me out. God got a hold of me and he straightened me out. I've seen myself slipping before and God's got a hold of me and straightened me out. But I've seen myself slipping and other people have gotten a hold of me and told me I'll never, I, I will never ever forget Sister Maud Arnold and Sister Ann Reed. They were two ladies that were members of, of uh, Calvary Baptist Church in Cynthiana, Kentucky. You know, those two ladies knew that when I came there, I was pretty green when it came to the ministry. I, 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 when I went to pastor their church, I had pastored a, served as interim pastor at the uh, Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Willow Hill, Illinois, for four months. I told the church when I went up there, I said, I will, st I will stay here approximately four months, but I'm going to have to, I'm going because I'm in school, and I'm I can't drive 365 miles every weekend. 
That's what I was driving, 365 miles every weekend. One way, not, not two ways, one way. Every weekend I was driving 365 miles one way and 365 miles back. And, and to pastor, serve as interim pastor of, of Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Willow Hill, Illinois. And uh, then, then when, I came, when I came back, I came back on the last Sunday of, 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 uh, of November. And that very day when I walked in the door, Rhonda didn't get to go with me because I, I don't know, I th she was pregnant or something was wrong. She didn't get to go. And anyway, um, I walked in the door and Rhonda said, there's somebody trying to call you from Cynthiana. And... Uh, I said, who is she? She said, I don't know. She gave him a number, and I called him back. And that was Sister Ann Reed. And she was calling me about coming down. She'd already learned that if this, this, that Sunday would be my last Sunday up there. She was calling me to come the next Sunday and preach at Calvary Baptist Church. And I did, and they called me as pastor. And And so, you know, that's that's what we do. That's what we do. And Sister Maud Arnold and Sister Ann Reed would take me aside if I preached something that, that was kind of uh, 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 not, not just right. They'd take me aside and they'd say, this is wrong. And they'd show me. They wouldn't get mad at me. They would show me. They would show me where I was wrong in some of the things I said. I was just green. I was young, hadn't been saved for just a few months. And, and, and so I, I, needed, I needed uplifting. Well, they, they provoked me to love and to good works. Now, there's some things that we need to consider here. There has to be a boldness to do good works. There has to be a boldness to do good works. Uh, the Old Testament saints had to wait on the high priest before they could even worship Jehovah. <coughs> they couldn't worship until the high priest told them to. High priest told me it's time now to worship. And they would worship. Well, the pastor here doesn't do any good for a pastor to say, it's time for you to worship. You still miss church. You still stay home. And so, but, but the priest, they could not even worship the Lord until, until the high priest told them it was time to worship the Lord now. They did it. The high priest controlled the worship to Jehovah. If you ever, uh, if you were an Old Testament saint in those days, you would have to wait until the high priest came out of the Holy of Holies before you would even know if your worship was acceptable. The high priest would come out and, and he would tell them, your, your worship is acceptable. You did what you're supposed to do. You did the right things when he would come out of the Holy of Holies. That's, that's how they were controlled. They were controlled not, not, not by, well, of course, by God, because the God was controlling the high priest, but the high priest was telling them when they were to worship, how they to worship, and if God even accepted their worship or not. The high priest, but boy, today a pastor is not to, as, as one man told me one time, uh, don't don't interfere in our business. You know, don't interfere in our business. But that's that's what the high priest did. <clears throat> He, he would let them know if their sacrificial type was fit to the coming Messiah or not. When Moses came down from the, uh, from the mountain, he let them know in a hurry the golden calf was not acceptable. Moses went up to receive the law. When he came back down, here they were. They had made them a golden calf. All the Israelites that were gathered out around the mountain they had made them a golden calf, and some of them had stripped off naked, no clothes on, and they were, they were marching and worshiping that golden calf. And, and so as a result of it, result of it, Moses threw one of the tablets of the law. He threw it down and broke it. He broke it. And because God had just given him the law that said, thou shalt not do those kind of things. And here they were doing it. Uh, there, so so Moses let them know that God was not acceptable with that. They they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought, well, we're to worship if we if we just make us a golden calf uh, that and and represent it as as God, 
then we, then we worship it, then God will be happy with us. Well, same thing Christmas time, same thing in the holidays. You know, I've had people tell me, don't you think God would be happy with me if I celebrate the birth of Jesus, even though the Bible doesn't say anything about it? Well, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's not acceptable service. Not acceptable service. They went before God for, uh, <clears throat> let, me get, let me get here. They went before God for you and, and he let them, I'm sorry, uh, and God worked with the Old Testament saints through the priest. As usual, there were those who didn't think Jehovah was righteous in doing it that way. Just like there are those today who think God is not righteous in the way he accepts them to worship. He that God, God is, God's too hard on me. God's too hard on me. God is too hard on me. I want to do this. I want to follow some of my family. I want to do this. I want to do that. God is too hard on me. Brother Paul's too hard on me when he preaches the, the word of God without uh, the unadulterated word of God without any apology. Brother Paul's too hard on me. God's too hard on me. Because I've got things I want to do. I've got friends I want to party with. I've got friends I want to do this. I've got friends I want to do that. God's too hard on me. You sitting up here telling me that I can't do that anymore? God's too hard on me. If that's the case, that's how some people see it. Too hard on them. They choose to try and forget God and do it their, their own way. That's what people do today. Instead of, instead of people worshiping, you know, we, somebody's got to stand in the, in, in the bulwarks and let people know that that's wrong. That's wrong. That's the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong, wrong way to be in that. One thing that we can learn today, God has given us a bonus to do good works. He's given us a bonus. You know, have you had a bonus to go talk to someone? I've heard people say, I, I just can't go to my family and talk to them. God will give you the boldness to do that. If you want to do it, if you really want to do it, you just say, well, I can't go to my neighbor and talk to them. My neighbor came to my house here the other day. She visit church here. My next door neighbor, she came over to the house the other day, and she said, would you pray for me right now? I need you to pray for me because I'm, I've, got some, I've got some trouble, some problems. And, and I did right there, right there where I was sitting. I was sitting in my recliner, and, and, and I, I raised up out of my recliner, and I took her by the hands, and she kneeled down, and I prayed for her right there in my study at home. You know, you, you've got to have boldness for stuff like that. You've got to have boldness to, 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 to do stuff like that. The Old Testament veil was rent, and the Holy of Holies become the acceptable place for us uh, to worship. Well, wh what's the, where is the acceptable place for us to worship today? Right here. Right here. You're in it. You're in it right now. This is the acceptable place for God to worship. God doesn't expect you to go out here and follow after some of this stuff that I'm here, I'm seeing on Facebook. If you're a member of Landmark Baptist Church, God expects you to be in the Lord's house on Sunday. He expects you to be there. Expects you to be there worshiping. Look at the eighth verse of the of the ninth chapter. Uh, we were in the tenth chapter, but go back to the eighth verse of the ninth chapter. I want to read something to you here. The Holy Ghost, thus this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, could not, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, with, withstood only in the meats and the drinks and, and the diverse washings and the, and, and the carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. So we can see that that God does not just accept any kind of worship. He doesn't accept any kind of worship in this. Because of all the proceeding, each one of us has a boldness to do the work 
God left us, us here to do. How much do we do for the Lord? We sing the song here. We sing, I, mean, I don't know, I don't can't remember the words of it, but, but said the Lord gave himself for me. How much have I given to him? Am I willing to die for him? He was willing to die for me. Am I willing to die for him? You see what we're talking about? God is not going to come down and shake you and put you right on your feet and make you walk in his way. However, he will visit you if you don't, if you don't uh, do what you're supposed to do, or the right things to do. Also, we talk about the breath to do the good works. The boldness to do the good works, there has to be the breath to do. What does breath represent in the Bible? Breath means the presence of the Holy Spirit. He breathes upon us. That's where the breath comes from. The Holy Spirit, he breathes upon us to do what we, he would have us to do. He breathes that upon us. He leads us to full assurance of our faith. He leads us. He breathes upon us the fact that, 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 we're, that, that, that we're saved, whether, whether we want to think about it or not. He breathes upon us those facts. It is written in his word. These things are written that you might know you have eternal life. And the Holy Spirit breathes those words upon us. Every time I get down, every time I get down, that's the first thing I think about is God said these are written that you might know you have life. And you have it eternally. These are written. The scripture's written. Study the word of God. See what the word of God says when you get down. You know, don't, don't go out there and try to find a, a, a party to go to. Don't, don't go out there and try to find a, a group of people who don't know what they're doing and think that you're going to find happiness and peace. You're not going to do it. Oh, you'll have fun for a little while. But it's not long until it goes too far. It goes too far, and then, and, and then you, have to, you have to realize, you know, that, that I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing these things that I'm doing. I'm a child of God. I shouldn't be falling after these things. That's the breath of the Holy Spirit. He leads us to clear conscience. He leads us to a clear conscience. You know, what's, what's your conscience today? You know, do, do you have sin on your conscience today? I do all the time. I have conviction. I have conviction of the Holy Spirit in my mind and my heart because I, I, don't, I don't serve God as I should. But, but you say, well, you, you're pretty faithful in what you do, but I still don't serve God as I should. I still don't, I still don't say the things I should say. You know, uh, I was here not too long ago. I was witnessing to a group of the men that I drank coffee with. And boy, one of them jumped up and left, and he said, I don't want to hear this no more. But I mean, it takes boldness, and he hadn't come back. Somebody asked me Saturday, they said, where's so-and-so? I said, I don't know. He got mad and left the other day, and he hadn't come back. But, but you've got to have, you've got to have, uh, he leads us to a clear conscience that this is what I have to do. This is what I have to do. He leads us to, to the, to the chastening of our bodies. I'm sorry, the cleansing of our bodies. This is not talking about uh, a sin or, or odor. It's not, I'm just not talking about dirt or odor being washed from the body by water, but water represents the word of God. Water, water, water represents the word of God, the washing of the water of the word, what the Bible says. You know, this Bible will clean us up. If we study it, listen to it, some people just don't study it. They just don't study it. That's, that's why when, when they get down and they, they really don't know, when somebody says, well, what do you believe? You know, how, how many of you have stood up and told somebody, I go to Landmark Baptist Church and I believe, I believe in election, I believe in predestination, I believe in the doctrines of grace. You know, do you have boldness to do that? I know you don't. I know some don't because I've seen, I've heard of some who never mentioned about their church, who never mentioned about where they go to church. As a matter of fact, it's almost like they were ashamed of where they're going to church. Don't be ashamed of it, folks. Don't be ashamed of the truth. Don't be ashamed of the truth. He leads us to an open profession of our faith day by day. 
He leads us to that. All this is done without wavering. We don't believe the we don't believe this week that it is right to do the work of God and come next week and try and justify the reason we haven't done what we should do. That's not what this place is for. This place is not for you to come in here and justify why you did what you did. You can find you can find every excuse. You can find an excuse for anything. And everything, you, that you can find an excuse that doesn't make any difference. What it is, you can find an excuse for the reason you don't do the things you do. But that's not, that's not, what, that's not what this is for. It, that's not what this is for. And I want to, I'll be concluding this right now in just a minute. And lastly, there is the base, the basic to, to prove, to reprove, and to good works. The, the, the basic, what is the basic? God has not only given us the boldness to do good works, but has given us a boldness to provoke others to the same. He's given us a boldness to do that. We should do that. I had a, had a lady call me one time, and she, she said he was a friend of mine. As a matter of fact, the, the, the boy was from Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And um, I really didn't know the boy knew me that well. But there's a lady called me, and she said, he knows you that well, and he said, you know what he's doing? She was a member of the Fellowship Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. She said, you know what he's doing? I said, what? She said, he's going around telling people about when they don't come to church when they should be in church. She said, he's going around telling people, said he sees somebody in, in, in the, in the uh, Walmart, and said he'll tell them, I didn't see you in church last Sunday. And she said, people are getting tired of that. I said, of course they will. But I said, he's not doing anything wrong. I said, he's not doing anything wrong by, by, by telling them they should have been in church on Sunday. He's not doing anything wrong by doing that. So there has to be the, the, the basis to uh, provoke to good works comes, comes from God. <clears throat> the first good work they are to be provided to do is to be in the worship service where they can learn what God has for them to do through the preaching of the word and, and, and by those who, who would preach what his work is. I have prayed for every one of you when I see you and you're not doing the work that you should do. I pray for you. I pray for people. I'll go home this today, this afternoon, and I'll pray for everybody that wasn't here today. I'll pray for everybody that wasn't here today. I'll pray for them. Lord, I pray, I pray that they'll see that the right thing to do is to be in the house of God. I'll pray for them. You must answer for yourself. I can't answer for you, for you. I can pray for you, but I can't answer for you. You must answer for yourself toward God. And I say God bless you today. I pray that God will lead you and direct you. We're going to sing a verse of song, and then we're going to be dismissed to